stock slipped despite strong overnight gains in the US and green ticks in Asia. Industrials and utilities lead the slide while IT shows resilience. Reliance Retail is set to acquire Metro AG's India cash and carry business in a 2008-50 crore deal. The move will enhance Reliance Retail's physical presence and bring a large number of Kiranas and wholesale customers into its fold. Ajanta Pharma gains following a small stake sale by promoters is well absorbed, while Bandhan Bank slips after a planned transfer of bad assets fails to enthuse investors. Kalpita Rupawa and GMC Projects swing after NCLT approves their merger. Hybrid immunity puts India on a strong footing against a new COVID wave, say experts who add that nothing has changed in India despite a surge in Omicron cases in China. Minutes of the MPC show RBI Governor Das and Deputy Governor Patra see the need to do more to bring inflation to the 4% target, while external members Barma and Goyal call for a halt to rate hikes as growth may be hit. Good afternoon. You're watching us here on Halftime Report. I'm Mangla Malu. With me, Sonal Bhutra, as well as Ekta Batra. Well, it is looking like a weak afternoon. No two ways about it. We opened higher. From there, we saw selling. There was a mild recovery from the lows. And thereafter, it was sold with full gusto. Now, the Nifty is below that 18,100 mark. Yesterday itself, the high was closer to 18,500. And in just two trading sessions, we've lost over 400 points on the index itself. The, the bigger worry is uh, the health of the broader markets right now. We have 2,600 stocks declining for just about 250 stocks which are advancing. So over the last few trading sessions, uh, when the advanced decline ratio was anywhere between 4 is to 1 or 5 is to 1, that has shot up to 10 is to 1, 10 stocks advancing for just one, uh, rather 10 stocks declining for just one advancing. And all of this, while uh, right, cases in China have risen. So this time around, China sneezed and India is the okay. one which has got a cold. Hi, Manglam. Hi, Sonal. Yes, absolutely. You know, the markets are under pressure. There are only around seven stocks within the entire Nifty space, which are, in fact, in the green. And uh, surprisingly, we've really shrugged off what the global markets did overnight, despite that enthusiasm for the U.S. markets from the consumer confidence data. But like you mentioned, China sneezed literally. <laughs> uh, but nonetheless, uh, you, uh, you know, uh, the experts have mentioned that the big plus factor for India is definitely the hybrid immunity that we have which is basically a combination of vaccinations as well as the natural immunity that we've had because of the exposure to COVID-19. Mm. So that is probably the biggest differentiating factor. Remember, till now, China has had a zero COVID-19 policy and we haven't. So that's the big difference. Let's see. It, as of now, there's just caution, um, you know, preparatory meetings which are happening at high levels. But uh, is it trickling down in terms of numbers? Not yet. Not yet. Uh, fingers crossed. Yes, fingers crossed. And let's hope 2023 doesn't start in what could be a COVID scare. So yes, caution there. But absolutely, uh, the experts have told us that there's nothing to worry about so far. And uh, just about our markets, uh, uh, you know, we are seeing that there is a sharp reversal, at least in sectors which are doing really well, be it the PSU banking space, be it the fertilizer names as well. And all the indices are in the red currently. So no green uh, as far as index movers are concerned uh, but we'll see which way things go it's the weekly options expiry as well today uh, let's uh, start the show with the first management on our show chemical major galaxy surfactants is in focus the stock this year is down more than 16 percent uh, centrum has initiated coverage and they have a reduced rating with a target price of 2749 rupees per share they're positive on companies expansion into green product segment and a lot more to discuss how the next year is likely to look like we're now joined by Kane Natarajan who's the executive Director and Chief Operating Officer at the company. Mr. Natarajan, good afternoon. Thanks a lot for joining us. Uh, well, you know, I wanted to get a check on how demand is on the ground in both your domestic and export markets as well. And has there been a sharp reversal in raw material prices as well? Quarter two saw a decline. Have you seen further pressure on them? Hi, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for having me on the show. Oh, yeah, so raw material prices uh, have uh, declined. Uh, since last three months, both the natural uh, uh, oleochemical uh, sub, uh, feed, uh, value chain as well as the uh, crude petroleum. Uh, but yes, uh, we, we see it sustaining and then we need to know, wait and watch uh, with the current uh, uh, headwinds in China, whether commodity prices further get impacted. But yes, we have a good uh, robust risk management framework in place to ensure that uh, we're able to manage the commodity risk pretty well. As regards uh, the 
uh, outlook for next year yes you know we are uh, uh, aspiring to grow ahead of the market uh, we still want to be keeping to our guidance of 6 to 8% volume growth uh, the uh, europe is certainly lagging uh, that's uh, very clearly evident uh, for almost all companies uh, who are doing business with europe uh, us is holding well india is a bright spot for us as and for many others as well uh, africa middle east turkey has been a, a bit of concern in terms of the way the volumes degrew uh, in the uh, first half of last year we do see some green shots uh, in the last two months uh, uh, we would hope that you know that particular trend continues and the momentum gets maintained so that we're able to start reversing the degrowth trend in the Africa Middle East Turkey market for us. Rajan, you said 6 to 8% volume growth. That is for the entire year uh, or what period is that? No, we're talking about next year. So this okay. year we probably would be uh, ending uh, a flat or a little bit on the negative side uh, because we reported almost 800% volume degrowth in the first half of the year. So flat or the negative side would mean that you have uh, further downgraded your volume estimation. I mean, you started with the earlier estimate of 6 to 8%, then curtailed it down to 2 to 3%, and now you're going down to flat or negative. Yeah, see, 2 to 3% for the, uh, we're looking at for the second half. So that means that we need to be able to get our uh, first half degrowth also taken care of in the second half. Uh, but the way we are seeing things, uh, we probably should be on the flattish side for the full year. Okay. Uh, Mr. Natrajan, you know, I wanted more colour with regards to any kind of disruptions that you're seeing on the ground when it comes to the situation in China. I know it is a very pre preliminary. Uh, companies want data, which is probably for, you know, maybe the next three to four weeks to assess whether or not there is any kind of tangible uh, impact. But what can you share with us at this point? No, we are seeing no impact because our supply chain is not exposed to uh the chinese uh, from china so we do have uh, a resilient supply chain as well as some materials that we source from china uh, we are not hearing much we are only talking based on uh, what we see in the reports uh, we probably need to wait for another two weeks to understand whether there's going to be any significant disruption in terms of doing business in china uh, that's that's something that we need to wait for at least next two weeks but do you see it to be temporary in nature, not similar to what you probably started, uh, what we saw at the start of COVID-19? Uh, the situation might be different? It may be different because I think uh, everyone is prepared well now. Because mm. when uh, we did have the initial uh, outbreak of COVID, none of us are prepared. But people are more wise now and the governments know what to do. Uh, and I think things would be much better managed uh, in terms of what are maybe the implications. Uh, we do hope that, you know, it uh, settles down quickly in China and then we are back to business as normal. Okay, that's the hope. Uh, Mr. Natarajan, in that case, you have scaled down your volume guidance further. What about EBITDA per ton? Uh, the earlier guidance was 16,000 to 18,000 rupees per ton. You have spoken about raw material prices coming down further uh, with value-added products going higher and raw material prices coming down. Uh, what kind of EBITDA per ton can you guide for in this year and the next? So, in this year, uh, we will be... Uh, uh, we have guided already to about 21 to 22,000 rupees per metric ton. And uh, we should be uh, uh, delivering on that. With regard to next year, is uh, only thing, given the current uh, external situation that we are in, I would like to only make a clear statement that uh, EBITDA growth will be out of the volume growth and our long-term guidance okay, is for a 6 to 8% volume growth and EBITDA growth of uh, 16 to 18,000 rupees per metric ton, closer to the higher end of this band. Okay. Uh, but yes, our EBITDA growth will always be ahead of our volume growth. That we are very clear and we have been delivering that for the last so many quarters. Oh, yes. Uh, what is the percentage of value-added products as a percentage of revenues? Are you looking at increasing this pie going from here? And Centrum says that the outperformance that we saw in FI22 uh, will taper down a bit in 23, uh, 24, that is. Uh, do you concur with that statement as well? No, that essentially probably the, the, the commentary would have... Uh, uh, concluded based on because our uh, uh, specialty ingredient market has a good amount of exposure into the developed markets that is the Europe and the US. So with the Europe uh, economy not doing that well for the reasons that all of us know, uh, that can be an indication. Uh, we do see that there are good amount of traction happening on projects in pipeline in our developed markets. Uh, we don't see that as a major concern now, but yes, we would only expect that Europe improves, uh, uh, you know, uh, from here on and us uh, although we do see some uh, cause of concern but there's nothing compared to what it is in europe 
Your capacity uh, over the last uh, few years has increased uh, by 50%. From FY16 to now, if I look at it, close to around 44,000, uh, uh, you know, or rather 4,42,000 uh, metric tons. What are your expansion plans from here on? What is your current capacity utilization? We are about a close to about 68% capacity utilization. And then we are expanding uh, into both the performance, surfactants, and the special ingredient segment. On products where we are touching close to almost 80% capacity utilization, uh, we have almost capex lined up for close to 150 to 200 crores in the coming year. Uh, there are some that will get commissioned in the early part of next year, and some that will get commissioned towards the end of the next financial year. Uh, so our objective is to ensure that we are able to have capacities uh, 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 well ahead of the demand growth that we foresee. And yes, uh, we do see uh, things uh, looking up pretty well after the initial challenges we are going to have uh, which we have been having in the last six to eight months. Things are going to suddenly look better as we move forward into the next financial year. Okay, can you leave us with maybe uh, some color with regards to geography such as Egypt, which were facing some issues? Oh yeah, so Egypt, uh, with regard to the significant devaluation that happened of the currency, there has been a significant hit on the demand. And uh, as happened uh, as it happened in 2018, when a similar devaluation happened, it takes almost two quarters for <laughs> the local demand to, uh, sorry, the local demand to then start getting adjusted to the inflation scenario. Uh, so we do see that things will start looking up much better for the local Egypt market, uh, say two quarters from now for sure. Okay. Mr. Natarajan, on that positive note, thank you so much for joining us. We would like to wrap up now and wishing you and the team at Galaxy a very happy new year. That's thank the you so much. <laughs> That's happy new to all of you as well. Thank you. All right, that's the word coming in from Galaxy Surfactants. For now, we'll slip into a short break. Up next, we'll be joined by Prabhakar Tiwari, who's the Chief Growth Officer at Angel One, to discuss their November business update. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Still tuned into Halftime Report on CNBC TV 18. Reliance Industries has announced the acquisition of global food wholesaler Metro AG's India cash and carry business for a sum of over 2,800 crore rupees. Manglam is standing by at the big wall to tell us more on this one. Manglam? Well, the news is official now. Uh, the company has informed the exchanges of them purchasing Metro cash and carry's India business. The deal was struck at a value of 2,850-odd crores. A little about Metro Cash and Carry. Of course, it's uh, the Indian subsidiary of uh, the global leading international food wholesaler. It entered India in 2003, and it was the first to introduce the cash and carry business to India itself. Uh, where do the metrics for that company stand now? They have 31 large format stores. FY22 revenue was close to around 7,700 crores, and they sell to Kiranas and other small businesses as wholesalers. And this is where Reliance sees benefits. The biggest benefit they get, they further send, strengthen their physical uh, store footprint. They give access to a wide network of Metro India stores in prime locations. But importantly, they also get access to a large base of regi registered Kiranas and institutional customers and a strong supplier network. And that exactly has been the case for Reliance, where they're eyeing the entire ecosystem. Analysts are looking at the scalability and synergies in this deal and importantly also eyeing whether there would be any horizontal or vertical expansion of Metro Cash and Carry, which currently is into wholesale. Can it actually go ahead into retail or not? And that will be important because Reliance recently launched their FMCG brand Independence with a wide array of products like edible oils, pulses, grains, packaged food, etc. And it's this ecosystem that everyone is uh, playing on. The Independence brand, of course, first launches in Gujarat then scales nationally, and this asset will be important for them to uh, you know, scale that business nationally as well. They've been growing through acquisitions and tie-ups. This year itself, there was you know, brands like Socio, Campa Cola, Preto Manger uh, brought by Reliance, and this over and above the near 10,000 crore investment that the company did in FY22. And of that, some of the important ones included the likes of 7-Eleven, Just Dial. We had a bunch of designer brands that came in, and Dunzo too. So what does all of this mean for Reliance? The big, uh, uh, you know, uh, the big ambition that Mukesh Ambani had given in the annual general meeting, that saying that Reliance Retail will become the largest segment within the group. The company goes ahead and puts their money towards acquisitions. 2850 crores for a 7,700 crore, uh, 7, crore rupee sales brand. Metro, not particularly bad. Analysts would just eye scalability and synergies.
Okay, all right, Mangdam, thanks very much for that. Well, let's move on then. 2022, in fact, saw some of the most high-profile mergers and acquisitions dominating the deal space. The year gone by was, in fact, marked by some of the much-awaited bailouts and landmark deal closures. It was also the year m and &E activity in India defied expectations. Our colleague Nisha Podar gets a deep dive on all the hot deals of this year. The year 2022, as it comes to an end, has clocked in deals worth $118 billion so far, majority of which came in from the mergers and acquisition space, while private equity also participated with $33 billion. Now, in terms of the sector breakup, well, top five in m &A came in from first, the banks and financial services topping the chart, followed by other sectors like manufacturing, IT, renewable energy, as well as logistics. Now, the private equity equity investments were highest in the e-commerce uh, space in the year, followed by other sectors like media. We saw a lot of interest, infrastructure, energy, as well as the financial services. Let's also take you through the top five deals of the year. HDFC and HDFC Bank's mega merger clearly is the largest, boosting the overall deal value for the year. And the second one is Wholesome Cement Assets, Ambuja, as well as ACC. And that was the most hotly contested battle amongst various conglomerates, won finally by the Adani Group. Now, Biocon's acquisition of Viatris's biosimilars business is also path-breaking in the context of an overseas acquisition done by an Indian company. Fourth on our list is uh, the global steel giant ArcelorMittal's acquisition of SR Group Sports as well as Power Assets, critical to its steel assets, which, remember, marks the fi fi full and final completion of the SR Steel's buyout via the IBC process, which, remember, has been a very long drawn deal so that comes to an end now and last is the yes bank equity deal by private equity firms carlisle as well as advent which remember is an important milestone is yes ba in yes bank's bailout plan now for the year ahead most deal makers are cautiously optimistic about the deal activity and consolidation could be a big theme play out as economic pressures weigh on the weaker companies. Now the startup funding winter is already here and expected to intensify further. With the valuations volatile, well deal closure could be a challenge while private equity braces up for some value buying in the next year. Deal Street indeed, Nisha. Thanks a lot for that. Uh, meanwhile, before we take that short break, just watch for the markets. There's been a mild recovery. We've uh, gained uh, past that 18,100 mark once again. But in light of the fall that we've seen, it's just a mild recovery. Where do we go from here? We have Pritesh Mehta of Yes Securities joining in with some trading strategies and an index call on the other side. Welcome back. Uh, well, we are seeing a wee bit of recovery in the market. So let's talk about what's taking place in the FNO end of things, more so because it's weekly options expiry today. There has been a sharp fall from highs across all the indices, no two ways about it. But this week, what really stood out was the weakness that we've seen in erstwhile outperforming indices. What were those erstwhile outperforming indices? The mid-cap index this week is down 2.7%. The Nifty Bank is down 2.1%. The Nifty itself is down just about 1%. The other indices that did well was the PSU Bank Index, which has been the star of this year, down 5% this week, and the Small Cap Index is down 4.5% as well. With the decline in today's trading session, the Nifty has fallen below the 50-day moving average. This is a mark that it was holding on earlier itself, and the Nifty Bank as well fell below the 20-day moving average yesterday. So what does that mean in terms of uh, uh, where the market is likely to end today's expiry with? There are a lot of call writers pinning their hopes on the Nifty not going past that 18,200 mark. The 18,200 call as well as the 18,150 calls have seen the most amount of open interest build up. And with higher India VIX, you know, these premium eaters have a fair amount of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, firepower with them as well. So levels upwards of 18,200 may continue to pose some sort of resistance. There you have the 18,150 call, almost a crore shares added in open interest. Uh, 18,100 put as well as 18,000 put, both of them come into play as well. Now more so because the Nifty is above that 18,100 mark. The premium on 18,100 put is 42 odd rupees. So that's telling you that levels around that 18,060 uh, would be an important support. And 18,000 is a psychologically important mark 
for 11 rupees, the street believes that maybe this is another mark that will hold on as well. So support between 18,000 to 18,050, resistance upwards of 18,150 to 18,200. Does that tie in technically? Pritesh Mehta joins in as well. Pritesh, your thoughts? Now, see, uh, if you look at the screen, it, 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 do, it, it, it looks scary. But we are just off from 800 points to the peak. It doesn't even matter, 800 points correction. And the way I'm looking at markets, the, the customized brand that we follow, it is an oversold zone. So th this, this is the right time we should be thinking of creating shorts. In fact, we should be uh, you know looking at a list where we can start buying now. So 7950, 18,000 is a zone which I'm keenly looking out for because I think this this market will try to hold around the support zone and then we can say recovery uh, kicking in. But again, you know, uh, uh, not the right time to create shorts. And the way I'm looking at it, uh, there are there are specific sectors which are showing strength. So we should be focusing on that rather than getting carried away by the decline that we have seen in last few weeks. Okay, and Pritesh, uh, what would your individual technical picks be? So see, I'm, I'm as I as I mentioned earlier that we should be focusing on the uh, sectors which are showing strength. So Nifty PAC basket, uh, this index has coming off, it has come down from its peak. But yes, uh, if you look at the broader structure, it is still holding on to the strength. It is still holding on to positive you know, bias. So I feel there is opportunity in this space uh, when we look something like IOC, HPCL, they are giving us an opportunity to create longs. And I'm talking about 15-20% more on the upside. So yes, there is opportunity in this particular space. And apart from that, when I look at my customized insurance index, it is holding on to lows for last few months now. So there is an opportunity kicking in in this particular space as well. So, you know, something like SBI Live looks very interesting. We can talk about, you know, once market stabilizes, this stock can easily give a return of uh, 15 to 40 percent in the next few weeks. Oh, okay. Well, SBI Life, to put it into perspective, is up around close to a percent at this point. It's given returns of around 4 odd percent on a year to date basis and is down around 3 odd percent on a month to date basis. Uh, Pritesh, thanks very much for joining in and giving us all of your stocks and what you're tracking today. We need to take a short break, but full tilt on Ajanta Pharma that, in fact, is reacting to news updates. We'll get you more after a short break. Welcome back. Well, we promised you about uh, Ajanta Pharma, so let's get to that. Ajanta Pharma is in fact gaining following what was a small stake sale by promoters and has been well absorbed. Uh, Vivek Iyer has been tracking this story. In fact, he broke it. He joins in to give us more details, Vivek. Uh, well, that's right. You know, actually, uh, Ajanta Pharma is the stock in focus. Uh, prior to today's uh, uh, you know, trading session, we had indicated that a large block deal of almost 4.56% stake uh, was likely to change hands and uh, we had indicated that you know it was going to be two promoter entities that were uh, you know likely to sell shares so along expected lines you know just prior to market opening in the block deal window we saw the entire block deal uh, getting consummated and in fact uh, you know just having a look at you know what we understand from our sources in terms of the likely sellers and the quantum of uh, the entire sale the promoter group entity sold almost four and a half percent stake in the company and this particular block deal was worth slightly over 650 crore rupees and now you know immediately close the block deal uh, what we understand is uh, the demand was quite good which is why we are actually seeing quite a bit of a bounce back as far as the share price is concerned uh, two promoter entities ayush agarwal trust and ravi agarwal trust uh, were the ones you know that have paired stake both of them held slightly over 14.3 percent stake in the company at the end of the september quarter and we understand that there is now a 90-day lock-in on further sale of shares on both of these promoter entities Okay, all right, that's Ajanta Pharma in focus up 3.5%, but that is not it when it comes to the pharma space. A lot of brokerages are talking about the sector, a lot of stocks. Ekta, tell us more. Well, yes, uh, you know, a lot of um, companies are in focus because of the flu season in the US. So now Nomura has written uh, quite an interesting report. They've indicated that data suggests there's strong demand for the drug Tamiflu, basically the generic version of Tamiflu, along with respiratory as well as antibacterial drugs. To put it into perspective, you know, the US is probably facing one of the most severe flu seasons it has in many years, and it was completely unexpected. Now, the US antiviral market, according to Nomura, could see a potential Q and Q rise of around 200 to 250 million dollars in sales in Q3. And relatively high value drugs such as Tamiflu generic, Albuterol, which is a respiratory drug, Azithromycin, which is an antibiotic, 
all of these could benefit. Now, Lupin, according to them, is likely to benefit the most from higher demand. Separately, Kotak has also written on Apollo Hospitals, and that stock is buzzing in today's trading session. They have a buy with a target price of 5470. According to them, there are some key investor concerns, such as a delay in Apollo Health Company's uh, fundraising, elevated competitive intensity for 24 7 fundraising is important in uh, Apollo Health Co. Uh, to ease out the cash drain. But the fundamentals, according to them, say, stay strong. So that stock is in focus on account of this note as well. All right, Ekta, but uh, that's not the only stock that you're tracking. Tri Strides Pharma, what, what's driving that stock? That's been buzzing around as well. Well, yes, there's a bit of a boost which has taken place with regards to Strides, and that is because they've got around 525 odd crores on account of deferred consideration on sale of the company's Australian operations in 2019. Now, the proceeds are going to be utilized to reduce debt in the company. To uh, give you a background, in 2019, Strides had exited their investments in Australia for around 394 million Australian dollars. Now, the company had used it for debt reduction. They received 300 million at that point, and the additional 94 million has now come through. Uh, to put it, um, to, just to give you a background on the debt, the net debt as of the previous quarter stood at around 2,200 odd crores. The company has guided for debt reduction of around 1,000 odd crores in the year, and majority is expected to take place in the second half. So that's on strides and a whole host of pharmaceutical <laughs> That's our pharma dose for the day, right? So a lot of stocks in focus today. Ikta, thank you for that. With that, we'll slip into a short break. On the other side, Abhishek will be with us to tell us how 2022 has been for the banking sector. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Still tuned into Halftime Report on CNBC TV 18 2022, the year when the Nifty Bank outperformed Nifty as three large banks, SBI, ICICI Bank, and HDFC Bank, saw a massive re rating in their valuations. Abhishek Kothari charts the ups and downs of the big three names in banking in 2022. For the last two years, that is 2020 and 2021, Bank Nifty has underperformed Nifty. However, in 2022, Bank Nifty has outperformed Nifty in a big way. So far, Bank Nifty has risen by more than 20-21% in 2022, compared to around 7% gains that you are seeing for Nifty. ICSI Bank has given a return of 25%, SBI about 32%, while SDFC Bank has given a return of 8.5%. Talking about SDFC Bank, for First time in three years, in a calendar year, SDFC Bank has given a return that is higher than that of Nifty. Well, large banks have seen massive re-rating in their valuations, the likes of ICICI Bank, SBI, etc. SDFC Bank has has its own woes with respect to high valuations getting corrected, which began with Mr. Puri retiring from the bank to now merger of SDFC Limited with the bank, which has not seen much enthusiasm from investors. Let's take a look as to what were the ups and downs of the big three banks in the banking sector in 2022 and what lies for them going ahead. So, loan growth. Talking about loan growth, SDFC Bank, ICICI Bank and SBI have all recorded record growth rate in all quarters of 2022. Corporates have started coming back to banks as money market rates have started to heat up, even as retail and MSME portfolio have been the big drivers of incremental loan growth in the banking sector. Strong loan growth momentum has helped the banks with respect to improvement in their net interest margins as well. All the three big banks have seen their net interest margin being the highest in the last five quarters. The key to re-rating has also been the reduction in stress assets. Talking about stress asset, restructure book, one of the most painful part of the stress assets in the last two years has been the huge amount of restructured loans. These were loans which were impacted from the COVID wave with respect to repayments. Now, restructure book for SDFC Bank, ICICI Bank and SBI have reduced anywhere between 30 basis point to 85 basis point in the last five quarters. Gross NPA. The banking sector has been battling asset quality woes even before COVID impact. COVID 
only added fuel to the fire and led to higher stress in the system. 2022, however, has been a different story. Gross NPA ratio has declined by 12 basis points on a low base for SDFC Bank in last five quarters by about 163 basis points for ICICF Bank and 138 basis points for SBI all over the last uh, five quarters, improving profitability. Thanks to strong loan growth translating into improvement in net interest margin, along with improvement in credit costs, banks have seen robust momentum in their earnings profile. Profit growth of SDFC Bank, ICICI Bank and SBI have been robust over the last few quarters and it continues to improve. Now, return on asset ratio has also improved for the banks. This can be said as one of the key reasons with respect to re-rating in the valuation multiple of these large banks. Now, ROA has improved by 14 basis points for SDFC Bank, 27 basis points for ICICI Bank and about 43 basis points for SBI over the last five quarters. This can be seen in valuation multiple of the banks as well, which has seen improvement in 2022. Abhishek, thanks a lot for that uh, wonderful wrap of the year that was for banks. Uh, we look forward to 2023 as well. But as we do that, you know, the market is back again below that 18,100 mark. So we've been talking about how any bit of uh, an uptick has been sold into more vociferously, currently back at the low point of trade for the frontline index and the mid-cap index, as we've spoken, has had it worse. But it's not all lost. A bunch of stocks are actually doing extremely well. They do belong to the pharmaceutical space, yes. But, you know, case in point, something like a Wokart, which has now moved to the high point of trade with a gain of almost 4 odd percent. Westlife Food, which is uh, the erstwhile Westlife development, sells McDonald's uh, franchise, uh, I mean, is uh, the McDonald's franchiser for South and West India. That one's done too well as well, up around 2 odd percent. And Nureka Limited is the other one, which is buzzing around with a fair amount of volumes, actually. That stock is up around 14% too. But uh, the other one on uh, uh, the block is uh, the new listing, which is Sula Vineyards, listed on the exchanges today with a subdued premium, just about 1%, but they're after sold off as well. We spoke with the MD and CEO Rajiv Samant, who joined us after the listing ceremony and spoke about uh, his plans of making this a 1,000 crore business over the next five years with 25% margins. What are the drivers? Let's hear him out. We have a fantastic journey ahead. Wine is growing faster than, than whiskey, than spirits, than beer. This is the story. It's a long road ahead. Uh, Sula is the leader in that. India is changing so fast. Wine has terrific prospects here. We are seeing revenues growing strong double digits. Of course, H1 was a, was a terrific H1. Uh, revenues were up 40% over H1 last year. We don't expect that kind of growth in H2. That's going to moderate. But we see growth across the board. 85% of our wine revenue, of our revenue today comes in from our own branded wines. But in terms of wine, of course, horizons are long. Definitely, we've got some plans for next year. I'm looking five years out. I see no reason why, you know, in a few years down the road, this should not be a thousand crore company. I don't see anything, any factors that are really going to push back on that. And really, I would say that that's something that we definitely have in mind. And in terms of margins, we've done some terrific work over the last couple of years, really to streamline things. So I definitely see margins remaining stable. And, you know, it's not a bad uh, guess to say that it's going to be in the 25% plus uh, EBITDA margin uh, range. That's that's definitely something that we're looking at. Okay, subdued listing for Sula there. That stock down around 4 odd percent. Time for a break now. On the other side, our commodity segment lined up with Manisha Gupta. Welcome back. Joining us on the show now is Surendra Mehta. He is director at India Bullion and Jewelers Association. Mr. Mehta, uh, what a great day because we're looking at higher highs for both gold and silver prices there. 55,000 is holding for gold, which is a five-month highs. And the silver price is nudging that 70,000 rupees per kg mark. I mean, we've done a low of around 53,000 in this year. And it's been quite a strong, good run-up coming in for both of these commodities. Uh, uh, yes, absolutely, Manisha. Uh, let me let me uh, start by saying that in 2023 we might see another big rally uh, coming for the gold and silver both. I I personally feel that uh, we are in the process wherein the other countries are now taking uh, head on with the uh, to the US uh, dollar, uh, like what Bank of Japan did. They they forced the dollar index to go down. And uh, uh, that is why the gold prices uh, uh, zoomed up uh, suddenly uh, and crossed 1,800 marks. Uh, 
Uh, I remember just two days back, I was on your channel and I, I stated that in next 15 days, it could cross uh, 18, 17 dollars, but it crossed on the same day. <laughs> that was, I think, probably Tuesday. So, so uh, basically, what I'm what I'm trying to say is that uh, uh, the the whole world is now uh, uh, into two fears. One is the fear of recession, and another fear, which is not uh, which is not very significant, but yes, somewhere down the line, it is in the mind is is about the uh, spark of uh, COVID again in some of the countries. Mm. Uh, I I personally feel that this is. Uh, uh, we might see some correction initially uh, in the first week of January uh, for the gold and silver both, but uh, but in 2023 we should look at another big rally and maybe the gold may touch about $2,100 and silver about $29 or so. All right. I really hope the people who are making their portfolios for 2023 are listening to this. Because, Mr. Mehta, when you look at this year as well, while, of course, most asset classes could be closing uh, relatively on the weaker side to even bearish a negative for some of them, gold, silver, even with the kind of decline that we've seen in dollar terms and not so much, by the way, for the rupee terms where we are in the positive, it clearly has done better than various other asset classes. For the year 2023, if, if, if there was an investor, if you were looking for an opportunity to buy, what levels would those be? Uh, well, I think uh, even current levels are very good levels. Uh, okay. You can, uh, I, I personally see a, a 30 to 45 dollar downwards at at any point of time, uh, which is normally the market trend because a market may go down by uh, by 25 dollar or 45 dollar uh, once in 15 days. So that is the risk only somebody is taking. But uh, but looking towards the uh, uh, inflation pressure turning into recession and spark of COVID in some other countries. I, I personally feel that uh, we are heading for the big crash in uh, other asset class, and which will, which will give uh, uh, definitely an advantage to the uh, gold and silver. Mm. So you're looking at a $300 of a jump up in the international markets as the best case scenario for next year. What would that mean for Indian markets, for Indian prices? I, I personally feel if the if the uh, uh, in the 2023 budget if the duty remains the same for uh, which is at present about 15 percent for gold and silver both, I feel that uh, we can see uh, gold at 63,000 in 2023 and uh, silver at about uh, any anything between 95,000 to one lakh and ten thousand. Uh, that is that is what I I feel both this commodity uh, can give a big big run up. And uh, more specifically, if, if you see just two days back, uh, in spite of fact that the uh, uh, dollar index went down, the rupee also depreciated. See, mm. that, is, that, is a, that is the biggest worry for Indian rupees. And if Indian rupees continues to depreciate, continues to weaken, then gold prices uh, will definitely rise in our country. Oh, well, absolutely. I just want to put those uh, or reiterate those numbers that you just told us. So the gold prices right now are trading at around 54 to 55,000. You've said 64,000 of a possibility in the next year. 63,000. 63,000. 63, okay. And silver are currently is trading at around 69 to 70,000. And you expect a 95,000 rupees of a, of, of a target in the next year there. So those are very strong numbers. But you know, the only missing piece of puzzle uh, here, Mr. Mehta, is the ETF buying globally, which clearly has been disappointing this year. How are you reading those numbers? Uh, I think we should wait for the December ending and we mm. should wait for the central bank buying figures mm. uh, because... Uh, uh, whatever uh, uh, information we are gathering from the world market, uh, there has been increase in the central bank buying in various other countries. So first, it, it normally happens, the cycle is like first central bank start buying, then ETF start buying, thereafter high net worth individuals start buying and at last the common man <laughs> buys. Retail buzz. So we are in the first, we are still in the first phase of uh, uh, buying. Uh, so I, I feel that uh, ETF number will, will jump uh, uh, in the first or second week of January. Okay, I have a final question, and this clearly is about on what would your favorite pick be here, because I do understand that a lot of Indians buy gold. Silver imports into India are at record highs this year. Are intelligent, uh, uh, financially able Indians really buying physical silver as well? Uh, see, look at the silver import. The silver import last year was about uh, 5,800 right. tons, and currently... I think till December, we are likely to cross 11,800 tons. So where all the silver is going, it means silver. And, and if you, if you uh, the, the, the major reason why, why there has been so much of demand for silver is uh, 
most of the uh, silver which is produced in Russia is not bought by the European countries and American countries. And that is why uh, there has been a demand for silver across the world and uh, specifically in India because of industrial usage and because of uh, uh, fear that the, that the silver prices might go up higher uh, because of uh, a major uh, Russian silver is not being brought. Uh, uh, the the import numbers have gone up, and uh, I I personally feel that uh, the investor uh, uh, in case of gold and silver both should should uh, start uh, making an SIP kind of an investment uh, because that would uh, average out his uh, uh, cost of uh, uh, gold and silver. Okay. Okay, Mr. Mehta, Manisha, thank you so much for joining us, taking us through that discussion. So gold and silver prices in focus at highs in last couple of few months. Markets, uh, that, that is the equity markets, they are still below 18,100. So the pressure continues. We'll wrap on this edition of Halftime Report Business Lunch coming up next. <laughs>